with your host, Jeff Gibbons. The show where we really get to know your favorite creators and make some music together. Today's show featuring virtuoso synthesist and piano player, J3PO. Here we are, episode three of Beats and Chats, and hey. we've got a very special guest here, Julian Pollock, also known as J3PO. Just so excited to have you on the show here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here all the way uh, just down the uh, down the coast from you, essentially. Just head south. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Started following you on YouTube and then went over to your albums and just got so inspired and I'm so excited to have a virtuoso piano <laughs> player, musician here. Well, first off, J3PO, let's just explain the acronym here. What's funny is that it actually has significance because it's uh, my initials, J uh, for my first name, P-O for Pollock. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that my middle name is Waterfall. And that right. three it actually is a W flipped on its it side. Is. There's the W, J-W-P with an O. I like having a moniker so that, you know, depending on what I'm doing, I, it just feels like things are a little bit more in their own their own boxes, you know. But yeah, I, I want to talk about your music. I want to talk about your journey of, of being a musician from when you were a kid. And then we'll get up to the present day and what you're doing now and where people can find you, where they can follow you, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, at the end of this, we're going to we're going to make some music. So that's something people need to stick around for. If they're new to Beats and Chats, that's that's the format. We do some chatting and then we make some beats. So why don't you start with you know, where things began for you, because they started at a really early age, from what I understand. Yeah, yeah. So uh, my family's musical. My mother's a pianist. My dad is a symphony conductor. He started out playing saxophone, was a jazz musician, then decided to go back to school, go to, into, got into composition, got into playing more clarinet. So, uh, but my mom started teaching me piano at five years old. Um, it was cool. I was not like, you know, I didn't take to it right away in the sense that I was like really excited about it. I'd say around like middle school, sixth grade, I really started getting a little more serious about playing piano. And uh, gotcha. I had a cool opportunity as a young youngster growing up in the Bay Area to go to a music school called the Crowden School. Every day we start out, or we started out with two hours of classical music. Mm -hmm. So it was a really kind of unique experience because everybody played an instrument and then because the whole focus was music, there was just yeah. this kind of really tremendous organic buzz around getting good at your instrument. And then in high school, I went to Berkeley High, which uh, in the jazz realm, you know, uh, Joshua Red Redman went to Berkeley High, Ambrose Akinwuziere went to Berkeley High, uh, Benny Green, Peter Affelbaum, Justin Brown, Thomas Pridgen, uh, Jonathan F Finlayson, a, a, the, the kind of uh, wealth of musicians that came out of that program, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing considering it's just a public school. I'd say in those high school years, that was when I really stepped on the gas with like practicing, mm -hmm. you know, like especially, you know, like with the jazz stuff, you know, practicing everything in 12, all 12 keys yeah. and like, you know, just really getting into it. And then after that, I, uh, I went to New York. I had a full ride to Berklee College of Music, which I think just in my family is like they, they want, wanted me to go to a university. Yeah. So I went to NYU. You did grad school, too? Yes, I got my degree in uh, both degrees in piano and composition. So we can call you Master Pollock. You can call me. <laughs> <laughs> that works really well, actually, doesn't it, with J3PO? You can call me whatever you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> That's great. The real schooling started when I got out of school. I joined a band called The Lesson GK, which had kind of a bit of a cult following. It was, it was a unique experience because we had a weekly gig at this place on the Lower, lower East Side called Arlene's Grocery. Mm. And we'd play from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. every yeah. Thursday. You know, the focus was to come together and feel good and forget about all of our, yeah. you know, yeah. woes or whatever. The idea was to be, you know, creating, you know, loop-based, beat-based music with yeah. live instruments. Okay. and coming up with everything in real time. And this was so, has been so informative for how I developed my own sound palette and just how I think right. about music because the right. musicians in that band, Lenny Deox Reese, Nicholas Semred, David Cutler, uh, Christian Almiron, the list goes on. The whole idea was counterpoint. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of people would come up, it was also an open jam. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody would start playing something and 
the first thing that the tendency is to say, okay, let me, I, oh, I hear that, I, oh, I, I can play that now, and then to double mm-hmm. it. But the whole concept of the band was understand what that person's playing, but now make up something that goes against it. Wow. Counterpoint. That whole concept really kind of informed how I produce and how yeah. um, I think about music. And yeah. also not to mention the fact that Nicholas Semrad and Christian Almiron are beasts of sound designers and just like coming up with sounds in the moment playing right. live. So anybody who knows me on the internet or whatever who is mm-hmm. interested in my sounds or anything like, you know, it, none of this is created in a void. There's always other people and other influences yes. and things that are coming together to, yeah. you know, inform everybody. Imagine all the people that are getting inspiration from you now, you know, hey. myself included. Uh, Let's pass it around. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, going back to your youth just for a second, you know, I thought I want to get this guy on Beats and Chats for sure. And then I find out that you were on Marion McPartland's Piano Jazz a very long time ago. (laughs) Kind of blew my mind. I think she started in like late 70s, 78, 79. and, uh, And she's this incredible jazz piano player from the UK, super respected, and then did this piano jazz thing where she would interview jazz musicians and they'd both be sitting at a piano, both playing, and then she would just chat. And so that gave me the idea to do this beats oh, and nice. chats thing. You know, you like that was kind of, I was just thinking, I want to do something like that with musicians and people who are posting stuff to social media and all that. And uh, and then I find out that you were one of her, probably one of her last guests, I, I imagine, because. What, that was in the early 2000s, right? 2006. 2006, okay. Yeah, so that, I mean, it's towards the end. I think she had another year or so, maybe, or maybe. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny, man. I, I have to be honest. Like, I'm super honored to have been on that show, but I, I was not ready. <laughs> I was 18 years old. I didn't know anything, yeah. you know I mean? Yeah. So you're 18 years old, and you're on the show with her. What was that like? Like, I mean, you're, you're working with somebody who's connected to all of the most famous yeah. jazz musicians of all time. So sweet, so sweet, and um, I mean, even at the time, I knew it was kind of ridiculous for her to be asking me questions. I wanted to ask her questions. Right, right, right. That was right when I moved to New York. That was the fall of 2006, 18 years old. So I was kind of just like, (laughs) it was just like sensory overload. No doubt. From that point, uh, all the way till now, I mean, my current boss is Marcus Miller, who is a huge legend in the world. Absolutely. Um, And uh, I mean, just... Being able to tour with him and hear firsthand stories about working with Miles Davis, mm-hmm. you know, that just the fact that he produced, you know, Miles's last records mm-hmm. and records that I love. I love Marcus's writing. Mm-hmm. I love '80s synths and sounds. Yeah. He is amazing. Just watching him play, just wow, that must be uh, quite the experience. The low end. Yeah, I've never, ever, ever played with anybody like that. His uh, not only is his style so unique. Yeah. and his composing and all that but i mean the playing what else takes up your time like what do what do you spend your time on it's uh i'd say that uh, behind the scenes it's a pretty big hodgepodge of yeah uh, stuff i i really yeah. try to practice piano i'm really in, uh, i've been learning a lot of well not a lot i've been trying to learn a lot of bach preludes and fugues right now on the piano wow. I've been practicing bebop i've been you know just i, I don't know i always find that uh, the practicing it's kind of like exercising it just makes you feel yeah. better yeah i mean for the past i'd say year and a, some change the bach preludes and fugues have just i don't know it's something i'm just like constantly thinking about and hearing in my head and you know i mean it, it's good for the fingers it's good for the mind it's good for the heart you did something recently didn't you where you played played something some yeah bach i played something. the uh i did c sharp major prelude and fugue from book one on the uh, prophet five it gives it a little bit of a different spin and it's also your instrument right now, right? My followers definitely know me for more for that than mm-hmm. probably playing piano. Well, speaking of playing piano, we could we can talk about some of your music that you you've put sure. out over the years, the Julian Pollock Trio, and there's one that's just Julian Pollock, and then you have J3PO as well. You're starting with piano, and then you get to the modern stuff with all the synths and things like that. The trio stuff. Uh, the records feature a rhythm section of Noah Garabedian mm-hmm. and Evan Hughes, uh, who also went to my high school. And then we also all ended up in New York at NYU. So we made our first record in 2010, Infinite Playground, which is on Spotify, and then Waves of Albion three years later. Mm-hmm. And that came out on Berthold Records, the German record label. Okay. Um, and I'd say that both of these records... I was, uh, and I st- to this day I still am, but at the time I was completely obsessed with Brad Meldow. 
Yes. It's something that has been so influential that, you know, yes. for some people like myself, it's just, yeah. you know, you're in, 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 at an impressionable age in your early 20s. So those records were very, very influenced by that trio. I don't know. To, to me, like listening to it, it's like well, you still have it, your own voice in there for well, sure. I appreciate you know, that. Such good stuff. A thing that a movement that's happening right. that Brad Meldow maybe started or it was at the helm, but it's like, it's okay if there's all this other stuff that comes out. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's interesting. I do feel that some people think, oh, I need to shy away from emulating a certain artist. I feel the opposite. I feel like you have to work through that. Yeah, that's good advice, man. Right on. Um, so let's talk about your modern sound now and, uh, and, and what, you're, what you've been doing. You started, I guess, 2016 with the Lesson yeah, GK. The Lesson GK, yeah. yeah. Tell us how that, that journey went. And yeah, sure. The synthesizer thing. And then you've got connections with Nord. Mm -hmm. You've got connections with Sequential. Sequential is that? Yeah. 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 And then a ton of uh, other companies like uh, Maris, Spread Panda, Strymon. Um, the Pedals. Yeah. Uh, connections with Tom Oberheim himself, uh, SoftTube, Universal Audio, uh, Expressive E, Expressive E. Yeah, I've, been, I've had a, a lot of great fortune to be able to to work with these companies, mm -hmm. working together, talking. I mean, it's inspirational. It's not about just like, hey, can I get some free gear? You know, I mean, like that will come, but it has. You know, it's like a relationship. It's you know, it's or it has to be organic. I don't work with any musical companies that I don't feel. A, a connection with yeah exactly or you don't respect what they're doing yeah you can work with multiple companies nobody you know because everything has been so decentralized it's not like there's just some magazine where everybody goes and sees a picture of that guy plays this board exactly you know yeah. <laughs> speaking of sense can you just talk about one of your signature sounds the polyphonic glide sure yeah What's funny, that's, it's really not my patch that's totally yeah. my friend Nick Semrad's I joined the band because he moved to LA and I was already obsessed with the band and just coming every week and wanting to learn how they were doing this improvisation. It's just funny because it's like, if I were to, to cite like my two major influences, I would say it's Brad Meldow and Nick Semrad. And it turns out right. Nick Semrad is also a very, very close friend. But anyways, yeah, that, he developed that sound on the, on the Prophet uh, okay. 08. Um, but yeah. he says he didn't even develop that. Right. He refers to Tonto. Okay. You know, or, or <laughs> Big Yuki is another keyboard player in New York okay. who, who was doing that. That style of patch is really basic. It's just a sawtooth wave with yeah. some, with, with some uh, you know, maybe some, some chorus. Um, and then it's the way that everything's mapped. So uh, a mod wheel is uh, controlling cutoff. Your other finger is on the, on the pitch bend. And then ap after touch is controlling the LFO, which is controlling vibrato. That's a very versatile sound that almost fits in everywhere. I'm playing, you know, just if I want to play a, uh, a pad. Yep. Or if I want to play, you know. You know, it, you can, it's a super dynamic patch in yeah. the sense that, you know, a lot of other patches, even if I play, you know, like a patch, like uh, some like more 80s vibe, you know. I love that patch, but it's not a versatile patch. I can't use that all over the place because it's right. specific. It's very specific, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh man. People are watching YouTube. They've got some kind of beat making software machine, Ableton, you know, MPC, whatever. What would you say to those people who are like, I know how to make beats, I I have good good timing, good groove and all that, but just the keyboard. Every time I come to that keyboard, those those black keys scare me, and uh, you know, I just I uh, scales. The, the the thought of a scale scares me. Like, what what do you say to people like that? You know, I've had a lot of students, had a lot of people hit me up on IG or wherever, and you know, ask these questions like, how do I get better? I just want to get better at keyboard. The truth is, is it's very hard work. You know, it's like going to the gym. You have to dedicate the time, and if you're you know if you're later in life. Uh, it is harder, not only because it's harder to learn at a certain age, but also our mentalities change. I'm always struck by, you know, my young students, which I actually don't have that many anymore. I only have one or two. They don't expect as much as us adults. And when that, those expectations kind of recede, 
in the background and it's kind of more just, I need to complete this assignment. Yeah. They actually get a lot farther. Um, and that's just something that I, in, in, inspires me to this day. Like, uh -huh. as I was talking about these Bach preludes and fugues, I'm not under mm -hmm. a shift, but I know that, okay, I'm just going to look at this one piece of music, eight bars, and I'm going to really learn it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try to learn this whole book. I'm really going to try to learn this one thing. It's not just the technique. It's it's the the, no, the uh, intellectual knowledge of harmony, how rhythm works, how melody works, how form works. Anything with quality takes takes time. And if you want to learn how to play piano and you want to be able to improvise, I always say you got to start with two five ones, man. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Mark Levine. And then if you do this every day or you know, multiple times a week. Yeah. After a year, I mean, you've, you've really learned a lot and you're able to do a lot more and it's, the sum of the uh, parts are greater than yes. individuals. Where are you going now? Where, where are things going with, uh, with J3PO, with Julian Pollock? Um, a lot of things on the horizon. Um, I've got a lot of new music coming out, which I'm really excited about. Um, kind of even jumping further out from Maine's, uh, my last record, incorporating live musicians more so than ever. And really kind of trying to marry those two worlds of being an electronic producer, a musician, instrumentalist, but now also incorporating, you know, live instruments. And more importantly, because instrumentalists, you know, having another artist on in your in, in the tracks, uh, everybody has such a unique uh, point of view. So that's been really fun. I actually have a new song. It is called February Wind. <laughs> I, and it's a picture of LA from our back backyard in Echo Park. And then uh, this is made by my uh, wife, Emily Herdeman, who's an uh, artist, photographer, painter. Um, and then the overlay is actually a uh, satellite image from NASA of the Santa Ana winds. And I wrote this a couple of years ago, actually, when one of those major wind events was happening. That's featuring uh, a guy who I was talking about earlier, uh, Russell Gunn. Uh, okay. plays in Marcus's band. He's also from East St. Louis, which, which is where Miles Davis is from. Yeah, incredible trumpet player. Um, mm -hmm. And that's Antoine Katz on bass and Amir Usman on drums. And then I did all the, I wrote the tune, played piano, keyboards, production, mixing. And, and then hopefully another full album of stuff like this that's very much a fusion of electronic music and uh, jazz. That's on the horizon. A lot of touring with Marcus. Um, yes. I just did, filmed a, uh, a, whole, um, a pretty extensive uh, production, electronic music, instrumental online course for open, tracks, uh, open track music. I made a tr uh, track from start to finish. Okay. Composing, producing, arranging, and mixing. So I'm excited for that to come out. Um, I'm also going to be doing a Synthesis 101 course this year okay. um, for people who want to learn how to design sound, you know, synth sounds, but the synth course will be available for my website. It should be a part of one's uh, process if you own one of these instruments. And you've got tons of that stuff on YouTube already well, thank you. that people need to go dig into because you've got <laughs> so much good stuff on there. I have, uh, I have a lot of other videos in the works too, just like yeah. little, little, little tidbits that can be helpful. Everything from like stem printing in your sessions to like how what's an effective way to use the metronome in your practice and i think i can just say one thing about gear in general and that is that um i just did a shoot in rob's rob rosen studio where there was you know it's pretty much every single vintage uh, synth ever ever made and it did make me realize that the older i get the less i realize i need if you learn sound design and you get a good instrument like a Rev 2 or a Prophet 6 or a Pro 3 or a, like you know these are expensive but you yeah. don't need a ton as a matter of fact, for me, I like pretty much, at least right now, just having a few boards up, you know, a polysynth, maybe a monosynth, and then something that can do roads and piano and all that stuff. As a producer and engineer, sound designer, instrumentalist, when you get to a point uh, where it's like, it doesn't matter what piece of gear is in front of you, yep. that's where you want to get, because you, exactly. then, then you, can, you can create with whatever you have. Exactly, that's great. One last question for you. We, we talk about music and your musical life and stuff. What's something you're into that people would have no idea that you're into? Well, if you look at the, the names of my records, you will know. Small Plates, Mains, and if you look at some of the titles of the tunes, you'll know that I'm a, I love cooking. I feel like food is and cooking is so similar to music and production. Um, and it's different because the experience of it is different 
because it's so immediate, it lasts for a second. What's your specialty? What's your favorite thing to make? Let's see, lately uh, I've been making uh, pizzas in the oven, uh, cast iron pizzas. So I've been making like focaccia dough and then baking it on a, on a ca cast iron. Also recently I've been doing um, like halal chicken and rice, like New York style cart. Okay. Uh, that's been fun to make. So there's, the food food is just a you know huge part of life for yep. me and my that's family. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. Okay, well, um, I think we could transition into making some music sure. now. Sure. Okay. And, Sounds good. Uh, I I just want to sit back and watch, but I'll I'll try and participate a little bit, and uh, we'll we'll figure out some way to send some things back and forth, and just come up with a little idea. So let's uh, let's start with some Julian Pollock keys of some sort. Sure. And maybe we should just let I'll let our audience know that. Uh, today yeah. they decided they knew we were to do this interview, so the jackhammer and there's a guy doing a drill out there. But hey, uh, you may hear some some sound design that is unintentional. Unintentional. <laughs> unintentional sound design. I got Ableton pulled up on my side. Uh, I think we should start with something synthy, maybe. Okay. All right. Yeah, maybe some interesting chords. So this is a Juno emulation, um, but we could just pick something here. Yeah, here's one for something maybe from my like. Yeah, one of your patches, nice. Flat. Let's do that. Yeah. So like an E minor nine, C major nine, up to D major nine. E major nine. Okay. D major nine, and then to C sharp seven alt. Okay. And, and so for the for the alt chord, we're talking like flat uh, sharp nine in there. So it's I got a C sharp down here. Three is my uh, is E sharp, and then just yeah, just a sharp nine. It's a nice little 16 bar loop. I'm gonna pull up machine for this one and just, and we'll come up with a beat. New expansion just came out and it's, um, it was by Snipe Young, super 80s vibe. Really nice crunchy kits in there. Nice, yeah, yeah, yeah totally. go okay we got nice. eight bar okay so i think we should send this over for uh some some bass okay so now you just emailed me your drums so let me so one thing i like to do is uh, keep everything labeled and colored i always do drums mm -hmm. in red yeah, your own colors i always yeah sense in yellow or whatever mm -hmm. my philosophy is Something new should be happening every four bars, sure. um, mm -hmm. you know, especially in this genre of music. Through the pandemic, I made my own like drum sample library just because sure. I had the time. So, for example, we're going to look at some uh, shaker loops you've made. Yeah. And did you actually record sounds and stuff for this? Yeah. So this is all organic stuff. Nice. Uh, at least these top ones. This is, these are uh, synthesized. This one might be even better. Let's see. Too far behind the beat, but we can always be be, uh, be smart and just be musical. Yeah. Let's see what that. Is. Amazing how you just move one, you know, something yeah. over a few milliseconds, and all of a sudden yeah. it's exactly Ooh. what the doctor ordered. Um, yeah. Um, another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start side chaining. And what's interesting about this technique is we're actually going to use an EQ within the sidechain compressor to mm -hmm. accomplish what we want. So we're gonna go here, we're gonna say sidechain. We're gonna grab the drums, but now we're going to listen and we're gonna just try to isolate the kick drum. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, we got 
just like that. So what we're going to do now is on this shaker, every time the kick plays, it's going to, we're going to pull the threshold down to uh, side chain mm -hmm. it so that the volume ducks. It'd be cool if I took off the uh, headphones thing. Now it feels like it's a little more married to the drum track. Let's start with a filter. We're just going to automate this filter. And I also want everybody to know that, like, we're obviously kind of speeding through this right now for the sake of the show. Let's have this come up like this. This way, now we know that, like, every four bars, something's going to happen. Now, in terms of bass, I'm trying to decide if we want... I like that. That's an 80s, my 80s soul bass. Nice. All right, that's going to be cool. Let's use, let's rock with that. Omnisphere has this new library. Uh, Eric, cool. Eric is a good friend of mine. Is he really? He's, a, he's an amazing musician, amazing oh, sound designer, uh, and is, Omnisphere he, is definitely, to me, the, the the greatest kind of virtual synth of all time. That's what I always tell my students and stuff, and like, they're just, it's the best. And um, and Eric seems like the nicest guy on the planet. Really, really wonderful person. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to jump on... Right? <laughs> let's uh let's really lo-fi this thing let's add a little bit of white noise Noise crash. Might be cool to do this one. Add a different one here, maybe. Let's just do like a little, little sweep. Um, let's just do one of these at the end. Let's keep it subtle, though. Keep it subtle. Let's tuck it, tuck it, tuck it. Maybe we'll end with this as well. Maybe not him. Do you want to add anything else, or I let's just do um, let's just do some solos now. Sure. Over top of it, you could. Uh, what I'll do is I'll put it all together afterwards. So you leave some holes, and then I'll fill them. Okay, sounds good. I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show. I'm sure my subscribers are just going to love hearing your story, hearing about you, and getting inspired to start making, maybe taking their keyboard skills up to the next level. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it tremendously. Yeah, thank you.